Uh, for those of you who don't know me, like Sean said, my name is Aaron. I'm one of the co-pastors here. Um, and for thank you, appreciate that, Carrie. There's, you could be having the worst day, but if you get up to preach and Carrie's on the front row, you know you've got at least one person <laughs> who's cheering you on. Uh, um, so, for those of you who don't know me or haven't heard me speak before, again, all of you who have, you've heard this disclaimer a million times. Uh, the way that I tend to speak is I kind of take a lot of rabbit trails, I'll ping pong around a lot. Um, for those of you who are much more orderly, you like things to have structure, um, this is a growth moment for you. Uh, we, are, we are going somewhere today. So uh, there are, f and also just some transparency uh, on my end, um, this week leading up to today was difficult. Um, and I have uh, every intention on talking about that, sharing some insight on that, uh, because I, I believe that real growth actually happens when we share process with each other. You realize that the disciples did not become the apostles because they just woke up one day, got zapped by the Holy Spirit, and then they were, they spent three years with God in the flesh. They were eating meals with him. They were asking him questions. Uh, in the midst of disappointments, in the midst of struggle, in the midst of all of that stuff, they went to Jesus and were able to talk with him and work things through with him. So I have uh, every intention today on hopefully getting to the passage uh, about the triumphal entry. Uh, but there are a few things that I feel like the Lord wants us to just kind of address this morning. Can we do that? Um, I'm going to read some scripture over us. Is that cool? Even if you said, no, I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> Colossians 2, starting in verse 13. And when you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. Here's one of my favorites in all of scripture. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. So if you're not excited about that right now, you probably will be in just a minute. Uh, in this series on building the hearth, stewarding the presence of God, and even coming into a season where our church we're starting to enter into what I've been telling people is a season of renewal. The presence of God is coming in in a uh, special way. He's coming close. He's reviving us. Lord knows us as a family and then us as individuals, we've all worked through some stuff in the last several years and it's been hard. But the Lord always comes back around and he revives his people. So we're entering into that season. Here's what I also believe the Lord is doing in the middle of that. Most of the time when we talk about and pray for seasons of renewal and revival, we just want the Lord to sweep in, kind of zap our problems away, and just have his presence come in and fix everything. There are times where he does that, but let me also say, he's in, even in the midst of those seasons, he's interested in growing you and developing you. This goes back to a word that I shared several weeks ago uh, where the Lord was talking to me. He said, Aaron, I don't want you to build me a runway. I want you to build me a greenhouse. So part of what the Lord's doing in us is he's actually not just coming in and sort of putting a healing balm over things that we've experienced and not just coming in and bringing breakthrough in strongholds that we have, though all of that is true, he's actually saying, okay, now that I'm doing that, as you're stewarding my presence, I'm actually going to teach you how to live free from and above those things that you used to be under. So let me give you some context and some insight into what I was experiencing even just this morning walking into today. There's, uh, I'm normally a very clear-headed person. My internal world is very steady I don't experience a lot of ups and downs, but going into this weekend, 
I could not think straight. I, I could not connect two dots for the life of me. There was a level of internal anxiety that I know is not me because it's not typical for me to live with that. I, live, I, I have a lot of peace in my internal world. And so I'm looking at this and going, Lord, what's going on? Um, and the reality is spiritual warfare is a real thing. And it's not just for pastors. It's not just for people who get up and speak. You actually have an enemy of your soul who, if he can't keep you out of the kingdom of heaven, he's going to do everything in his power to keep you stuck in the same place that you entered in at. Are you, are you understanding me? So part... This is all part and parcel of what the Lord's doing in our body, where he's actually teaching us, you know, Ephesians talks about that he gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers to get us all into the maturity of the fullness of Jesus. So where God's taking us is actually that each individual member of the body would be able to display and live in the maturity that Jesus demonstrated while he was on the earth. One of the th ways that he does that is actually coming alongside us while we engage with spiritual warfare, okay? So sometimes in circles that many of us run in, we uh, have this saying where I, I don't want to pay too much attention to what the enemy is doing. I don't want to give glory to that. Yes, and... Scripture says that we should not be ignorant of the enemy and his devices. So as I'm talking about this, and again, I will get to the triumphal entry today. Uh, there's just some stuff in the room that I felt like I was supposed to address. Um, as we're talking about this, this is about us as a body being able to identify together. Oh, that thing is actually not me. That's the enemy. And we need to be able to talk about this and share this with each other. Because here's, here's what I've learned. Just some, Can I give you some practical wisdom that I've picked up over the last year? At least 50 to 75% of the intensity of the attack that you feel breaks just when you share with somebody else what you're experiencing. We have... There, there has developed a culture in the church that says, I'm honoring Jesus by shoving down the attack that I'm experiencing, that I'm actually honoring Holy Spirit by shoving that down, pretending it's not there. How are you doing, brother? Amen. Glory to God. I'm doing awesome. Comfortable with whatever amount of territory he has in how you live, how you think, how you act. So when the Holy Spirit comes and actually clears space for you, he wants to come in and challenge that. And here's, again, I know this is benefiting at least a few people in the room. If not, I'm preaching to myself. So there you go. Um, we, when we're unaware that that dynamic is at play, we will experience breakthrough and then backlash will come. And if we're not aware that that's what's happening, we'll think and misname the backlash as oh, that breakthrough that I thought I experienced was just an emotional, spiritual high, nothing really happened. And then we end up giving back ground that the enemy, that, that we took back from the enemy. So this is just, you know, public service announcement. <laughs> this is what we're entering into. And I hope, is this encouraging for at least a few of you guys? Does this give some... And can I... Just by a show of hands, we'll just do this. Is this, are any of you guys identifying with what I'm talking about right now? Okay, keep your hands up, look around. We are, <laughs> she's out for blood today. She said, those are the honest people. So just take that moment to become aware, whatever you feel like you're slogging through, you're not going through it alone. Novel concept, let some people around you know and have them pray for you. Yeah. God might do something. <laughs> All right. Palm Sunday? Today's Palm Sunday, right? <laughs> oh, man. Um, I'm going to be reading out of Matthew 21. 
starting in verse 1, just going through the triumphal entry. Um, And I I feel like, just to name what I believe the Lord is going after in our hearts today, as again, we're in a season of learning how to steward God's presence and build the hearth. Um, To name what I believe he's going after in our hearts today, just so that you have something to anchor yourself as I'm, again, taking rabbit trails all over the place. Uh, He is addressing in us two things. One, the need for humility. And two, he's addressing offense in our hearts that we have towards him. I guess I poked a few things there, so we'll just keep on going. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 21. When they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples telling them, go into the village ahead of you. At once you will find a donkey tied there with her foal. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. This took place so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. Tell daughter Zion, see your king is coming to you gentle and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Just if you're going to underline something, it's already bold in mind, but just underline that because we're going to get back to it. Verse six, the disciples went and did just as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and its foal and they laid their clothes on them and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their clothes on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. Then the crowds who went ahead of him and those who followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in an uproar saying, who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. So if you've Again, been in the church for any number of years. You've read this passage or the similar one in any of the other Gospels, particularly read on this Sunday, Palm Sunday. Uh, there, there are a few things that I want to just look at, if I can kind of give you a, a window into my brain and how I think when I look at Scripture and when I'm reading this one. Uh, we have the unique benefit of knowing where Jesus is headed while we're reading this story. And if you keep those two things in mind, there's a few things that just don't make sense to me or just seem odd. And as a side note, if this is help, this will be helpful for you. Uh, Many of us, when we read scripture, we see things that produce tension, whether in our logic or in our own hearts. And we want to oftentimes move over that. I will tell you the deepest wells are found when you stay in and go after the tension that you see in Scripture. Sin is actually the fulfillment of messianic prophecy. That's when you see and you're reading in Scripture and you see that indent and you see bold. Some different translations do it different ways. These are quotations from Zechariah 9 and Psalm 118, all of which are pointing to this point in history where the Messiah, the King, is going to come and set his people free. Here's what's odd about that, though. If you're expecting a conquering king who's about to kick out an occupying force, why is he on a donkey and not a war horse? I don't know how many of you guys grew up around farm animals or have at least seen them. Uh, Donkeys have short little stubby legs. You're not going really far. (laughs) You're not moving very quickly. So what's going on? And and this is actually where, this is, number one, Jesus is fulfilling prophecy again. This was actually prophesied hundreds of years before by Zechariah. Behold, your king is coming to you on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So he's fulfilling prophecy, but here's the message this also sends. The the king that's coming in is infinitely more humble than you would expect. And let me take it a step further. He's more humble than we usually would even want him to be. You have to think that they have all of these expectations around what the Messiah 
is going to do. He's going to come. He's going to kick out Rome. He's going to inaugurate the day of the Lord where Israel is kind of the center of, you know, activity in the world. The, the fulfillment of all these promises in the old covenant are going to come forward. And they're placing all that expectation on Jesus, which as a side note, I will say they weren't wrong on what he would do. They weren't wrong on who he was, but they did miss the timing. Because let me be clear, Jesus is going to be coming back and kicking out the leaders and the rulers of this world who would oppose him. He is coming back to do that. He rode in at this point in history on a donkey, but he is coming back on a white horse with a sword coming out of his mouth, faithful and true, written on his leg. And I'll draw attention to that just to say, you can know what God has called you to do. You can even have a strong sense of who God calls you, not just your corporate identity as a believer in Jesus, but you can have a strong sense and be accurate on your personal identity, who he's uniquely made you to be. But just having those things doesn't mean you're in the season where those things are going to come forward. Can I tell you that I just personal experience, I knew I had a call to ministry. I knew I had a call to preach. I didn't know uh, that that was going to start to come forward into its fullness on the tail end of the desert years that were 2020 and 2021 for me. I actually thought it was <clears throat> going to be launched doing missionary work <clears throat> in Berlin. And the Lord had other plans. And actually my assigning my interpretation of what God told me he was going to do in my life my, and equating my interpretation of what he said with what he was actually saying, equating my expectations of what he meant to the same level of what he actually said, doing that set me up for a disappointment that I did not need to walk through. And it's a similar thing Again, we have the, the benefit of knowing how the rest of the story goes as we're heading into Holy Week. These same people who were proclaiming the inauguration of the kingdom of God, that Jesus, their king, was coming in to set things right. Those same people who are shouting Hosanna on this day, just five days later, are shouting crucify him. We oftentimes think of these stories so modularly, like we take them one at a time that we forget. Those same people who were blessing him, those same people who were throwing their cloaks out on the road for him to come in, are the same ones less than a week later saying, actually give us the murderous thief Barabbas over this man. And it's because when Jesus didn't meet their expectations, they allowed a fence to build in their hearts. And when we, here's, here's what's dangerous about a fence like that. It's one thing to hold a fence, like we already know that that's sin, we know that that's wrong, but here's, one of the reasons why, and I'll take a side here and I'll pop back into, I told you I was going to take a bunch of rabbit trails today. You will grow leaps and bounds in your understanding of the heart of God when you, again, this is without arrogance. This is with genuine curiosity. You will grow leaps and bounds in your understanding of the heart of God when you see something that scripture calls sin and you say, okay, God, I trust you. I believe you. Why? Why? Because I can tell I made a few of you uncomfortable. <laughs> I'll expound on that just a second. Uh, do you know that there's a scripture in Psalms that says the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Do you know that God's setting 
boundaries, setting standards is not so that you can walk around on the boundary line saying, see, look at me, I'm following all the rules. It's because everything within the boundary lines that he's set is where flourishing in life happens. So when he's defining something as sin, he's not saying, he's not orchestrating the Christian life around, do not do this. He's saying, this is the boundary line. Everything before that is where you have peace. It's where you have life. It's where you live the life I've designed you to live. So when we're talking about why should we not hold a fence, coming back around, why we should not hold a fence, because a fence, when you leave it there to fester, begins to act as a justification for your accusations against God. And as you've stewarded offense in your heart towards the Lord, as, and I will say we, because this is something that's common to humanity. As we steward offense in our heart towards the Lord, God, I prayed for that person. Why did they not get better? God, you said you were going to come through this way, and I thought it was going to look like this, and it didn't happen. And when we, again, so buy into our understanding of how the Lord's going to come through, that when it doesn't happen exactly that way, we allow that offense to build, we, that offense takes our souls into a spot where we're now agreeing with the accuser about who God is. If you follow Jesus for any length of time, you will run headfirst into things that do not make sense. You will run headfirst into seasons and situations that you're like, Lord, this was not in any of the prophetic words you gave me about my life. <laughs> what is going on? And those, I'm not saying that God causes death or causes these painful things to happen to teach us something. That's a misinterpretation of a lot of scripture, I believe. But we do serve a God who's too good to waste a crisis, if I can say it that way. And what he does in our hearts in those moments is he actually like puts a mirror up to our faces and graciously says, these spots where the offense is, where the anger is, that you actually, if you're honest with yourself, are there, but you don't want to name because you're afraid of what I'll think of you if you acknowledge that I'm actually angry at you. Us to the Lord. These spots in, our, in your heart, these are all the places where you took your expectation of what should happen or needed to happen and actually set it on the same level as me. Can I tell you the, the verse that got me through that multi-year period that I was talking about? It wasn't that I got an answer. It wasn't that, you know, I had a vision and all of a sudden everything made sense. There's a lot that still doesn't make sense. The verse that got me through is when Jesus is talking to his disciples after he said, you know, eat my flesh, drink my blood. He blows up his very successful ministry because thousands of people who are following him around leave him. And then he looks to his disciples and says, are you guys going to leave me too? And they say, where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. <laughs> when those unmet expectations come to the surface, acknowledge them, say, God, I'm sorry, show me how to not do this again. But then the thing that will carry you through those seasons is saying, God, I've, I've seen too much. <laughs> this doesn't make sense, but I know you. And that purification that happens is actually what sets you up to walk into, many times, the thing that you thought God was going to do on the front end. Am I making sense? How'd you get there from he came in riding on a donkey? I don't know, but we got there. <laughs> so God is this, he, man, the, the humility of Jesus. Can I just take a moment to, 
just revel on that for a second? A couple of thoughts. No, number one, again, this is sort of jumping out of the passage into some practical advice for us in the season that we're walking through right now. Many times when you're seeking the Lord for breakthroughs, seeking the Lord for an answer to prayer, uh, the grace that you're looking for exists a couple levels lower than you feel willing to go in the moment. We, we serve a God who left heaven, the place that we're all trying to go. He was already there. He left that to come here knowing that he would suffer. And here's, again, just a nugget that I, I think about often from the Lord. The Son of God becomes human. Already crazy humility. But to put some flesh on that, Jesus was discipled. He was taught underneath Joseph. He learned the family trade from him which means that the God who created the trees that Joseph is carving came to Joseph and said, hey, dad, can you teach me how to do this? Can you, can you teach me how to put this together? This is, the, this is the humility of the God that we love. The same God who, when everybody is expecting him to come in riding on a war horse, says, I'll take the donkey, thank you, I'm okay. And here's, again, this is, I think the best preaching oftentimes causes more questions to pop up in you than gives you answers, so I'm just going to, give you some stuff that I'm still thinking about. Um, Jesus is unmoved and undisturbed by their incorrect expectations that they're placing on him in this moment. Does that, does that mess anybody else up or is it just me? Like, we, we so, I think we so often live in this world of, like, like we think of the Holy Spirit as this divine nitpicker, if I can say that. We, we think he's just there combing through our thoughts, just trying to go like, that one's off, that one's off, that one's off, you're wrong here, you're wrong there, you're wrong there. And Jesus is fully okay in this moment, knowing that they're actually even though they're correct in their assessment of who I am, the reason that they're worshiping me right now is because they think I'm going to give them something that I'm not giving them right now. And he is unbothered. He is undisturbed. There's, which also goes back to humility, I think. Part of what humility looks like it is not becoming a doormat for people to walk, walk all over. So some of you guys need to be set free on that end. And it does look like Jesus is so aware of who he is, so secure in that, that he is unmoved by people's incorrect assessment of who he is. And praise God, right? If you, none of us in this room are going to see him in heaven and go, I got all of that right. <laughs> Nailed that. which is where we start to get this beautiful revelation of just how deep the grace of God is. Like there, there are things, hear me, there are things that we know to be true, things that he's revealed and things that, you know, there are hills to die on, okay? I'm not, don't hear what I'm not saying. 
but the father is so much more concerned with shaping you into the image of his son than making sure that your theology list is exactly perfect. Can I just set a couple of you free today? <laughs> like, all of this is about, like, we, we just get a window into the heart of Jesus right here. And here's, here's another thing. I, ha, has anybody else ever stressed or been anxious about the, the worship that you give him? You're like, man, am I, am I doing this correctly? Like, we... It, scripture does tell us, you know, examine your heart. It does say, you know, if you have aught with a brother or a sister, resolve that before you go to worship. There, there are commands that we have around that. But have you ever gotten into this place where you're in worship, but you're so aware of your own mess that before you know it, you're just kind of navel gazing more than actually looking at him? Part of what I think this passage communicates is that he actually, he still receives that worship. He still so loves, it. and if you're hearing anything in all of this, just hear that he's so crazy, madly in love with you that there's actually not a point where he stops loving you just because you break a, break a rule or break a standard. He does call us back into it because he knows who he made you to be. He does call us back into truth, back into alignment. But he's still the gracious, humble king who chose to ride. He, again, this is, this is his introduction to the city that he knows he's coming back to thousands of years later to reign and rule on the earth. His introduction. And he chooses a beast of burden. This is the God that we serve. Another thing that I want to point out, man, time goes by so quickly when you're up here. We, we see a bunch of quotations of Old Testament passages as we're reading through the triumphal entry, yeah? I mentioned Zechariah 9, Psalm 118. Uh, here's something that gets pointed out, at least to me that I'm seeing in the text as I'm reading. Um, that... He's not in our story, we're in his. He's not in our story, we are in his. I regret to inform you, you are not the main character of your life. <laughs> and that should, for some of us, I'm sure that's offensive, but for others that should actually set you free. And even having that mindset is what sets you up for a certain level of the disappointment that leads to that bitterness towards the Lord that we were talking about earlier. When you think of yourself as being, you are, I am the main character of my own life, which means everything needs to end up resolving around what I want, what I think I'm called to, all of this stuff. When we have that mindset, you expect basically everything to end up going your way on some level. But when you reframe and actually have a biblical and correct understanding of your life, that you are a small part of what God's actually doing in the earth. You begin to read hard passages of scripture that say, in, like in this world, you will have trouble but take heart, I've overcome the world. You begin to see those and actually you can hold both sides of it. Because how many of you guys know we sort of like to read the Bible and then take one half of a scripture because we like it a little bit more. We, we like to live and take heart, I've overcome the world, but we don't realize that to get to the spot where we're living out the revelation of that means in this world, I will have trouble. And you recognize we're, we're living into his story, what God's doing on the earth. And even then you start to, I could go off on this. I'm not going to totally go there. Uh, we have this thing 
that, again, American culture, I think, has played into a lot. Where we see people who are occupying positions of leadership, they have a lot of visibility. And because of how American culture has kind of shaped us and formed us, we think that if I was obeying God more, if I was doing more what he told me to do, I would, and I were successful in what God was calling me to do, I would look more like those people who have a platform. That is the result of a way of thinking that says, I am the main character of my story. But when you recognize, no, this, I'm actually a part of what he's doing. This is his story. This thing is all about Jesus. This is all about God coming back and setting everything right. This is about God communing with humanity again. This is not about me getting you know, my emotional needs met by being able to talk on a microphone. This is not about me getting my affirmation needs met by getting a pat on the back for every person who sees me pray for my coworker. This is about what God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit actually want to do on the earth. When you get that understanding, you can actually be okay, fully alive, fully in love with Jesus, fully in love with the life he's calling you to live, whether you've got visibility on you or not. I'll just remind you really quickly that Jesus spent 30 out of his 33 years without hardly anybody knowing who he was. And he was still pleasing to the Father. So again, this was probably not the traditional <laughs> Palm Sunday triumphal entry message you were used to, but again, I, there, there are times where you will interpret a text, you'll, you'll read it, and you're getting you know, just sort of the core of it, and you just go through factually what's there. And there are times also where God's doing something so particular in a community that we need to take a few minutes just to zoom in on, you know, God, what are you doing here, and what are you doing with us? So today was that. Um, would you all stand, please? Uh, the call today is going to be pretty simple, pretty straightforward. I believe that the Lord is just creating space for us today to be vulnerable and honest with him around where we have offense in our hearts towards him. Because here, here's the other part of this and why I even believe he's highlighting this for our community right now. I fully believe that God's doing something in the Sacramento region and I believe he's up to something in our church. If you allow unmet expectations towards the Lord to, to fester and create bitterness in your heart, you will actually pull yourself out of the running sooner than God would have you. To, to explain that a little bit, you, you will only trust and risk so much on somebody you have offense towards. Let me put it that way. And where God's taking us, where he's growing us, what he's inviting us as a body and as a people to step into is going to require trust. It's going to require faith. It's going to require risk. And it's going to require us partnering with him to grow beyond where we're at right now. And if you have a fence in your heart towards him, it will be very difficult for you to trust him in that process. So I'm just going to pray and then I'm going to invite, if, you, if you're resonating with that or Lord knows I touched a million different points today. <laughs> if you're resonating with anything that I spoke about, and particularly if you've got offense in your heart towards the Lord, 
please come forward and I'm just gonna pray for us. So, Father, we just welcome you, Holy Spirit. Lord, would you pull us out, get us out of our own way, Lord. Jesus, where we've got unmet expectations towards you, where we're believing, where we feel like you let us down, where we feel like you didn't step in when you were supposed to. God, I'm asking for grace in, in hearts this morning to acknowledge where we're feeling that so that we can come clean and actually move forward. We love you, Lord. Jesus name. Uh, I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward. So if you're on the on the prayer team, please come up towards the front here. Uh, there are a few things that we felt like a couple of us felt the Lord was highlighting today. So I'm going to call those out and if you identify with those again, we want you to come forward and receive prayer because we believe that when the Lord identifies something, it's an indication of his heart to actually bring breakthrough and healing in that thing. So I'm seeing, we've got a couple of things. Uh, the Lord wants to, wasn't thinking about this when I was talking, but deal with issues of trust. He, there's faith rising in the room. Um, he wants to heal people with sickle cell anemia, with gastritis. Uh, there are people here, you said you can't remember things. Uh, you've even said my brain doesn't work that way. And the Lord actually wants to restore your memory, restore how your brain works. And some of you, you desperately want a closer relationship with God, but you don't know how to get there. He wants to meet you today. Another one, we had somebody again who's a, trusted person. Uh, they wrote in, they said, I'm, I'm not inside the church currently, but I can feel the spirit of suicide and depression very heavy. And I believe there's someone here dealing with slash contemplating this. And the, the words that came to them was, this is my last ditch effort to cry out and hear an answer that gives hope. So for any, any of those, if you identify with any of those, I'm another one last second, Lord's healing people with lower back injuries. Um, if any of those you identify with, please come forward. We want to pray with you. Otherwise, I'm going to just pray again and bless you guys as you go. So Holy Spirit, I thank you for your people. I thank you for what you're doing in our community. God, I ask that you would break through in lives, break through in healing. God, would the, the revelation of the humble King sink deep into our hearts. And God, even as we're entering into Holy Week and meditating on your sacrifice and what you did, I'm just asking that you would shift things in our hearts, God, that this would not be a place where we grow overly familiar with you, that you would reignite something in hearts today, God. In Jesus' name, amen.